United Nations troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. An advance whose purpose, General Ridgway states, is not to seize ground, but to wipe out the enemy. The Chinese Red Army, fighting desperately in small isolated stands, prefers to give ground on wider fronts rather than join battle. And it's up to the infantry to clear out the pockets of die-hard communists. With the enemy falling back to the Han River, United Nations commanders had expected that the Reds would make their stand there. But under a steady, withering barrage, Every war leaves its mark. Every period of history deserves mention of some armed conflict or other. Yet visit a library near you and look up the words Forgotten War in the online catalog. It is astounding to see just how many conflicts throughout history have been described as such. Books with the term Forgotten War included in the title have been written about all sorts of wars from international conflicts and humanitarian crises to some of the key military events in early American history. Even World War I, unquestionably one of the most gruesome and consequential wars in history, and one whose memory is certainly kept alive through various museums and monuments all throughout Europe, may not be faring so well on this side of the Atlantic. The Americans have not remembered World War I. I wish they did. I talk about it a lot with my students because I think there are very, very important lessons to be drawn. Had World War I been the end, had it been the war to end all wars, as it was called at the time, maybe we'd reflect differently now, but in a sense, World War I just became the prelude to World War II. And in that sense, World War II swallowed World War I, maybe in the collective memory, in part because some of the same soldiers and some of the same nations fought on some of the same battlefields. Um, and so I think that goes away toward explaining um, maybe the, the, the less attention that World War I gets nowadays. Sadly, what would have been the war to end all wars in a more just world has largely failed to capture the American imagination. Take a look at the way in which the First World War is memorialized on the National Mall compared to its sequel. It should be perfectly obvious which of the two wars Americans are more interested in remembering. There are many valid reasons why the Second World War continues to absorb so much of our attention even when at the expense of other important conflicts. No other war in history was so widespread and destructive, nor did any manage to produce such a universally recognized dramatic persona. The controversies surrounding other wars in the 20th century are largely absent from World War II. It had a clear, iconic hero and a clear, iconic villain. The United States only entered it after having been attacked by the enemy, not the other way around. And it had a happy ending, defined by a series of victory parades following a total Allied victory in 1945. Hence, its status as the good fight has endured. World War II enforces the idea of America as a global savior, coming in to fight the bad guys and save the day while bringing peace and stability to less prosperous nations. That makes it a war which the United States remains eager to celebrate and promote. World War II we call the Good War, and we, the people who fought it we refer to as the Greatest Generation, and that's a war that actually fits our narrative about American exceptionalism. But after that we're in trouble. Hopes for a bit of peace, following years of intense bloodshed worldwide, were dashed when thousands of troops were rushed out to a faraway land known as Korea after the North invaded the South on June 25, 1950. The map of Korea at the time made it clear that the region had become a microcosm of the Cold War landscape. America had to prove it had the upper hand in this emerging conflict, while the United Nations, largely an American-backed initiative, had to demonstrate its value as a peacekeeping force, which its predecessor, the League of Nations, had failed to do. 
Hence, a great number of United Nations forces, about 90% of which were American, became engaged in what became a three-year operation. Fierce combat ensued as the two sides pulled each other back and forth across the peninsula. All those who survived the fighting would forever be shaken by what they had seen and experienced there. And giving close and welcome support to the surface forces in the attack are the ever-present air force. During the time that I was in Korea, I, I experienced a number of uh, uh, difficult circumstances, uh, including engaging in the Battle of uh, Pork Chop Hill, where we lost a lot of uh, people, as we did on Jane Russell Hill. I think a lot about the people that we lost during the war, and uh, I, uh, probably not a day that goes by that I don't think about some of my buddies that I left there. The nightmare would endure for the American troops, particularly once the Chinese Red Army made an unexpected entrance into North Korea and join the fight. Namely, While the bombing campaign against Japan in World War II had been hellish, in this war, the United States bombed Korea four times as badly, flattening most major cities in both the North and the South. To no avail, however. After realizing that the fight was going nowhere, both sides agreed to a ceasefire on July 27, 1953. Only a ceasefire, though, not a full-out peace treaty, meaning that the two countries technically remained at war and that the U.S. would not dictate terms of surrender as it had grown accustomed to doing. The nature of this denouement, as well as how the conflict had played out for the Americans, made the kissing and euphoria of V.E. Day seem a million miles away. The Korean War is an ugly, drawn-out affair, fought in a place where American policymakers said we didn't have any interest, where the American military thought we didn't have any real interest, and it was a bloodbath. For the United States to actually have a stalemate with a peasant army, despite our atomic bombs and our overwhelming power, that was a real setback for the United States and its pretensions about being the most powerful force on the earth. And so, and so the Korean War we forget because it's not, not a war that we're proud of. It always takes time to properly evaluate the impact and legacy of wars. Yet after a generation had passed, the scholarship was in, and the verdict was unkind. The Korean War had become America's forgotten war. In sharp contrast to World War II, this was a war without any iconic hero or villain, in which the United States had not been attacked first, and which had ended with a tense and messy armistice in lieu of any victory parade. The enduring images this war produced were not of American soldiers rushing onto the Normandy beaches and wiping out the Nazis but rushing away from scattered, ill-equipped Chinese troops and perishing in the cold of Korea. For these reasons, America is seen as keen to forget the Korean War as it was to remember and celebrate the Second World War. Granted, many of those unfavorable qualities also applied to the Vietnam War, a conflict which bears many alarming parallels to the Korean War. In fact, Vietnam was in many ways a more devastating and total loss than Korea had been. Yet because Vietnam dwarfed Korea in scale, duration, and media coverage, and also produced far greater nationwide backlash and domestic repercussions, Vietnam became a generation-defining conflict for the United States in a way that Korea never did. A primary reason why the latter is considered forgotten in America is because it was sandwiched between two other wars that developed into all-conquering cultural obsessions. At first glance, this three-year conflict may appear to be of secondary importance in the grand scheme of the Cold War and the 20th century's military timeline. Vietnam had this, this impact that was beyond foreign policy, that was beyond geopolitics. It seemed to redefine American society, uh, U.S. society. Um, Korea was just something that had happened beforehand, seemed to, at least in my imagination growing up, have a localized um, impact. It, it left the divide in Korea, and that was really about it. It is easy to think of the many ways in which the Korean War's cultural impact is limited. 
Wars are often best remembered for the influential and recognizable images which they produce. There is certainly no shortage of those from World War II and the Vietnam War. Conversely, it may be rather difficult to think of any such images from the Korean War. It was simply a war which failed to produce any signature iconic imagery. Even this Pulitzer Prize winning photograph from 1951 by Max Desper is far from world famous. As for movies about the conflict, well, at least they'll always be MASH. But compared to the unbelievable wealth of films, not to mention novels and plays that have come from its 20th century counterparts, it is easy to recognize the extent to which the Korean War lags in terms of cultural focus. However, we are doing our obsession with World War II and Vietnam a disservice by failing to remember the Korean War. Given its status as a key product of one of these wars, and a key catalyst of the other. To do justice to our undying fascination with World War II, we must fully appreciate its global impact. Humankind's fiercest ever combat left 70 million dead and two superpowers standing, both of whom came to first mistrust and then despise one another. The Korean War is among the first and one of the most devastating consequences of this ideological rivalry forged by the Second World War. After having drastically cut its defense budget after 1945, the United States multiplied it nearly four times over to close to $50 billion by 1953. While war-weary America had been on the path of disarmament and demobilization after the Second World War, the Korean War played a significant role in setting the country in a different direction. Heightened military strength, wariness of global communism, and commitment to defending faraway regions, particularly in East Asia, from neighboring attacks. When we allow the memory of the Korean War to slip away through our fingers, we allow all these important clues about the origins of the Vietnam War to slip away as well. Korea was, it's directly relevant to understanding the Vietnam War. Um, wholly apart from the idea of, you know, fighting communism and the domino theory, etc. Um, how we fought the Vietnam War was uh, guided in large measure by what we thought we did right and wrong in Korea. We went in, in Korea from uh, the defense of the South to an invasion of the North. Uh, and in, in Vietnam, no one seriously considered um, taking the United States military troops across the dividing line into North Vietnam because of the lessons of Korea when they happened to the Chinese and we were not to make that same mistake again. Um, there was talk in, in the Korean War of uh, possibly using our nuclear arsenal against the Chinese. By the time we get to Vietnam, there is no serious talk of using our nuclear arsenal. There's no serious talk of bombing some you know, Chinese and Soviet cities for their support of the North Vietnamese. So we have learned, in a way, from Korea, in very important ways, that affects our overall strategy in Vietnam. The impact of the Korean War extends well beyond the Vietnam era. South Korea remains a drastic contrast to the North in such significant ways. Human rights, democracy, interaction with the outside world, friendship with the United States, and so on, for reasons which stem directly from the outcome of that war. Meanwhile, since 1953, North Korea has descended into a frightening state of isolationism, totalitarianism, and militarization all fueled by a poisonous loathing of the United States. North Koreans speak of the victorious Fatherland Liberation War, a patriotic war fought against American invaders and their allies. America's relentless bombing, 635,000 tons of it in all, and repeated threats to use atomic weapons against Korea in the early 1950s are kept fresh in the minds of today's citizens. Seen from a different angle, its death-dealing radioactive cloud spreads for miles above the Pacific. North Korean government and propagandists have created an enduring message that the United States should be seen as a ruthless, hated enemy, and that the country must defend itself against such an overwhelming foe by developing a nuclear stockpile of its own. North Korea's actions endanger the people of Northeast Asia. They are a blatant violation of international law, and they contradict North Korea's own prior commitments. As has been demonstrated repeatedly this past year, the threat of a nuclear North Korea is still very serious. The story of how that threat 
grew to become so severe is badly incomplete without mention of the Korean War. The reviving of the historical memory, uh, moving Korea from the Forgotten War to one that seems pertinent, is contemporary issues demand that we look at it more seriously. Simply put, we owe it to ourselves to remember the Korean War, so as to better understand the many ways it has and continues to influence the course of modern history. The millions of soldiers who served in that war, including over 2 million living American veterans, are certainly worthy of remembrance, as are the American statesmen who, as Henry Kissinger wisely described, took a historic gamble by committing troops to a faraway land which only a few months before they had declared to be irrelevant to American security. Moreover, forgetting the Korean War sets a dangerous precedent. If we rush to forget wars because we are not proud of them, we did not clearly win them, and because they dragged on for far too long at the needless cost of many American lives, what will our attitudes eventually be towards more recent conflicts like Iraq and Afghanistan? Iraq, we're not going to want to remember. Afghanistan, we're not going to want to remember. These are wars that have gone on for uh, 16 years and 13, 14 years, and we still haven't ended them, and we still are losing territory. So these are not wars. We haven't fought wars that we're proud of. Here in Washington, D.C., the most symbolic gesture to preserve the nation's military past comes in the form of the numerous memorials dotted along the National Mall. Among the most moving of these is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in the Constitution Gardens. This memorial consists of two enormous walls, as well as two statues added in later years, which make the connection to the Vietnam era more visually explicit. It is a project that has been well received, judging by the millions of visitors it attracts each year, and the great crowds of veterans that attended its 35th anniversary in 2017. Although critics have recognized the limitations of honoring solely the American losses in Vietnam. So the Vietnam War Memorial Monument, the two walls now, uh, with 58,000 plus names, are 492 feet long. If you included the names of the 3.8 million Vietnamese, over a million Cambodians and Laotians, the Brits, the Aussies, the Thais, everybody else who died in that war, it would actually be more than eight miles long. And that would be a fitting monument to the Vietnam War. But it's not a fitting monument, and Americans have forgotten it, uh, especially the younger generation. Across the reflecting pool lies Vietnam's counterpart, the Korean War Veterans Memorial. Here stand 19 statues of American soldiers, 38 if you count their reflections in the nearby mural wall, a reference to the 38th parallel that divided North and South Korea at the outbreak of the war. Constructed in 1995, the memorial was designed to underscore the heavy tolls the war had taken, as well as to bring to life the horrific conditions soldiers had endured, especially during the cruel Korean winters when temperatures often dropped to negative 30 degrees. Many veterans, as well as their descendants, view these efforts as a success. That's well, great, as you can see, people come back and, and uh, put wreaths and flowers and flags so they're remembering their, their uh, forgotten warriors, whether or not they've died in the conflict or have died since. Uh, it's great that it's located, I think, near the Lincoln Memorial, so it brings more people to it, so it brings more attention to the Korean War, I think. Uh, hopefully more people will, will remember it in their history, remember those who have fought and died, as it says, freedom's not free, which it's not, which we see all the time around the world. Every time I go to the monument for some of the services that we conduct there, um, I always have the feeling that uh, this is the way we look, this is the way we behave during those times. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, fitting monument. Memorials cannot do the whole job by themselves though. It largely comes down to the way history is taught in schools and which conflicts are granted enough attention in the classroom. In these regards, as others, the Korean War appears to be lacking. In the case of students taking world history as part of the International Baccalaureate program, their history teacher had devoted a greater than traditional focus to the Korean War. 
This approach had apparently succeeded in revealing the historical and contemporary significance of that conflict. I would often think that it's more important than the Vietnam War in the sense that it marks the beginning of an era of U.S. foreign policy and sort of a shift in how uh, Western Europe and the United States sort of uh, combats extremist ideals. We were asking why, like, we're having this tension with North Korea and nuclear weapons and why people, why the U.S. should be scared. Um, and that goes directly back to the Korean War. Before taking this class, however, these students appear to have had little contact with the Korean War, aside from having visited the memorial on the National Mall and hearing from their grandfather about having served as an engineer. They agreed that its status of the Forgotten War was accurate. It really is the Forgotten War, so nobody really ever talks about it. Vietnam, everyone talks about it. All the movies are about Vietnam. No movies are about Korea. And yeah. All I knew was there were cool fighter jets, and at some point the Chinese sent a whole slew of men to just do a good old pick and charge type thing. I never really knew what was happening with the context of that, what the Korean War was. I guess that's why it's called the Forgotten War. Without gaining a grasp on Korea in the classroom, the war is likely to remain forgotten amongst Americans. It unfortunately seems likely that many students fail to achieve such a grasp particularly in a country where fewer than 20% of high schoolers are deemed to be proficient in history, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and equally few students seem to be particularly enthusiastic about having to attend history class. Whether we do not have the strength to confront uglier periods of our past, whether we get distracted by more prominent and triumphant conflicts, or whether we simply do not put enough effort into teaching and studying history at all, there are many factors which allow us to continue regarding countless wars as forgotten. The downsides to this trend are real and alarming, as many scholars of history can acknowledge. Forgetting history is dangerous. It's got palpable consequences. If the Americans had learned the lesson of Korea, we had learned the lessons of Vietnam and remembered those lessons, perhaps we would not have gotten involved as we did in Afghanistan, perhaps we would not have gotten involved in Iraq, perhaps we would not have gotten involved in Libya. So Americans forget that, that history, they forget the history of the wars, they forget the history of our military involvement. Every time we don't dig back into the history to understand some of the origins of these issues. Uh, we, we lose something and we lose the ability to really understand it critically. What can be done about it? I think that begins in schools, but it also um, it is part of our uh, civic dialogue it, and it takes um, uh, Americans to be concerned about their country uh, and not just daily political battles, but to um, learn uh, about the past as a way of um, sort of bringing more depth and breadth to um, ongoing current political disputes. So, what can be done to reverse this discouraging trend? Should history teachers make a collective effort to focus on all wars, not just the most obvious ones, in their classrooms? As North Korea continues to test its nuclear weapons, should the media more explicitly highlight the historical origins of such a dangerous regime to the general public? Can the present be used to illuminate the past and validate the study of it? What solutions might work remains to be seen. But from honoring those who risked their lives half a world away, to limiting the gaps in our modern historical timeline, there are so many reasons why the effort to keep military history from fading in our cultural and academic memory is worthwhile. The Korean War must not remain the Forgotten War, nor should any conflict be put in its place. Every war, every piece of the great puzzle that is history, deserves to be remembered and understood to the best of our ability.